Welcome to the New Money Habits Podcast, where we talk about how to create a better plan for your money so you don't have to live paycheck to paycheck. Here are your hosts, Sarah Jones and Nino Villa. Welcome back, Budgeteers. I'm Coach Nino Villa, and I'm joined, as always, by Sarah Jones from Keeping Up With The Joneses Financial Coaching. Today, we're going to be talking about what you do after you've written your budget. So many good financial coaches will tell you that you have to have a plan for your money for that month before the month begins. So when you're thinking about how you're going to budget for March, you should be sitting down in February to do that. But what about what happens once you have the budget actually written down on paper or wherever you write it? Then what? So, Sarah, that's where I want to get the conversation started today. What do we do after we have the budget written. I love that. Um, You know, I would say it's great if you're writing a budget, but if you're never looking at it again, then what was the point of writing it, right? So there's more to it than just putting it down, you know, just writing it. Um, There's a lot more to it. So, you know, we know, we talk about this all the time, you know, that we're building our budgets or writing our budgets based on pay periods. So, you know, when you're looking at it, um, you know, I write my budget each month based on my pay periods and I color code everything um, because I like to make it as fun as possible. But I do that because um, I need to know what paychecks are paying what bills. It allows us to be in control of the money coming in and where do we want it to go out, right? What expenses do we want those paid periods, those paychecks to cover? Um, And so after I've written my budget, make sure that it's all color coded. I know that I'm in control of where the money is going at all times. Um, And I know that you do this kind of a little bit differently than I do. We use different tools to, to help us do this. Um, And, you know, that's important to find something that works really well for you. Um, and I'm a pen and paper kind of girl. I'll say it probably until the day I die that, you know, I use a lot of different tools, but pen and paper is my favorite. So write my budget, color code it, um, and do it before the month starts always. So you know what to expect. You're not waiting last minute. Yeah. I think you said something, uh, that was really important there that I want to reiterate and make sure that our listeners are hearing. And that is, It's not about the way I do it or the way that you do it, the tool that we use, but it's about the fact that we do it, right? So we both agree to the principle that you should have a plan for your money before the month begins. So again, if we're thinking about preparing for the month of March, we should be sitting down in February and and getting that plan down on paper somewhere, whether that's physical, like with a planner, like you do, whether it's digital, in a worksheet, like what I might do, it's the principle still the same. And so, you know, and, and you, another point I want to reiterate that you made is that we teach and we think you're going to be best served by actually making plans for each of your pay periods and not just the month. I know for me years ago, I got into the trap of only March income could pay March expenses But when your first paycheck in March is the 14th of the month, but you had March rent to pay, I felt lost. Like, wait a minute. So I'm supposed to be two weeks behind on my rent. What's going on? And and that might just be me. I was maybe a little bit more dense than most. Like, uh, Nino, you could easily have paid your March rent with some February dollars. But I was, everybody said budget for the month. And I, I was just thinking March dollars for March expenses. And so I got a little bit trapped there. But I think, you know, and as much as we can dive in, and I think we are going to dive into a little bit of how to do that well, I think you and I are most excited about talking about the execution of. Now you put it down on paper or you you marked it down digitally. And now let's go execute. Because to your other point, If you wrote it down and then you just kind of throw it off to the side and you never look at it again for the rest of the month, what was the point? Right. 
<laughs> I seem to ask that question a lot because I hear it a lot, you know, and it's a lot of questions. You know, we receive a lot of questions from people asking the specific thing. Then what? You know, like it's written and then what do I do? I don't look at it again. Well, we want you to look at it, you know, and, and because that's the point. So tracking. So you've written your budget. Next step, in my opinion, is tracking. So knowing um, I've got a lot of my bills on automatic payments. Um, you know, that's what works for me. Some people like to pay things manually. Um, you know, again, whatever works mm -hmm. best for you. But when an, I know an automatic payment is coming out, then I go on my budget and I make a check mark next to it. For example, and I'll just tell you, <clears throat> I know this might not come out, you know, in, in the time frame, right? So keep in mind when I'm saying this, that this is the last day of the month that we're filming this. But I paid my next month's rent. I live in a fifth wheel and we pay monthly rent where we're at. I paid my next month's rent today and I paid last month's electric bill. Um, mm -hmm. Because they do it, you know, I pay a month ahead for rent and then pay for my usage from the month. So it's the last day of the month, but this is for the, the next month, right? So the following month mm -hmm. I paid my rent. And so I marked in my budget, right? I had planned that. That was my, I call them rollover dollars, you know, your account cushion. So um, I budgeted for my last paycheck in February is covering the first part of March's bills. And so I go through and I make a check mark next to the amount that I budgeted, I make a check mark next to it. And for example, this is a good example. And, you know, I budgeted $120 for my electric bill. Turns out it was 103 So I made a note next to that. So what I budgeted was, you know, uh, 120 but it was only 103 And, um, you know, I'll just, this is what I use. Like, it's literally my planner and I color code. So my rollover dollars are what covers these first of the month's bills. Okay. So for so. those of you listening to the podcast right now who might not be familiar, we do record these uh, with video as well, and then we post those to YouTube and to Rumble. And so if you're interested in seeing anything that Sarah or I end up demonstrating throughout this particular one. We'll, we'll do our best to describe it for our listeners. But if you're looking for that visual component as well, you can simply search up New Money Habits on YouTube or Rumble, and you'll find the podcast ser series there. And so, um, you know, take a look at that as well. So, okay, so Sarah, you use a planner, mm -hmm. uh, and it looked like a monthly planner from, you know, the first to the end of the month. So, um and then it looks like you have your little pay dates outlined mm -hmm. and then your 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 expenses highlighted. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so again, I like to color code because you know, you know, even if we like numbers, so much of this isn't necessarily fun, right? It, it, so <laughs> right. It's not necessarily fun. So I want to make it as enjoyable as I can. And anybody that knows me know, knows I like a lot of color. Um, you know, I use different colors of pens on different days of the week and, you know, it's got to be colorful and I, have got to make it fun. And so, yes, I use a planner, a monthly planner and I color code. And so everything and, you know, so I'm showing right now my March budget. This is my budget that I, that I wrote out. Um, mm -hmm. and I've got right up here. So my rollover dollar. So these are the dollars that I earned in February that are covering March's bills. They're color coded in oh, okay. color coded in orange. And so I know that those rollover dollars are covering, you know, the first week or so's bills of March until our next payday. So okay. and then each payday is color with a different color. And then the bills that are getting paid from that payday are colored the same. So correlating colors, paychecks to bills in what they're covering. Now and another part of this, you know, is my husband and I have different checking accounts. So we don't have just one mm -hmm. checking account. Um, he's got his and I have mine. Um, and this is another thing. Again, you do what works, you know, best for you. And so I color code by paycheck specifically um, because what's coming out of his account versus what's coming out of my account. We keep track of them differently and separately. Okay. All right. So 
a lot of organization there and it's it's there it's physical it's tangible mm -hmm. it's right in front of you um and it's and it's a quick visual of this is these are the bills that are aligned to this pay period and these are the bills that are aligned mm -hmm. to this other pay period so very cool well as somebody who likes to do everything digitally <laughs> you know I, I've, I've fallen victim to, you know, if I, if I didn't have a device in my hand, I would be lost. <laughs> um, if I didn't have digital apps to help me with these things, I, I would, uh, again, be lost. But the principle, I, it's so interesting to me, again, that the principle is the mm -hmm. same, right? It doesn't matter what tool you're using. But let me go ahead and kind of demonstrate and share with you um, the worksheet that I use. So you're going to see that it includes um, that same principle of like lining a pay check and the expenses for that pay period uh, all to the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I believe, Sarah, you can see what I'm sharing, right? So I can. I can. Mm -hmm. All right. I just want to make sure that it's going to be um, captured. So... At first, it's very colorful, and it looks like, wait, what the heck is going on here? But it's pretty simple. There's some categories, and more importantly, there are some paydays that we or pay dates that we need to enter. And so, if I was building out my budget for March, I'm simply selecting when my pay dates in March are. And in March, it's going to be March 11th and uh, March 25th, right? And so then. It, it, there's a spot for me to capture what, what's coming in and then a bunch of different spots to capture what's going out. But I'll just take a couple of these real quick as an example. So let's say, again, I'm trying to plan for rent or mortgage. Well, I'm not going to wait until the 11th of the month to pay my rent or my mortgage at the beginning of the month. So when planning for March, March rent has already been paid with February dollars. So I'm gonna do something similar here just to demonstrate. So in March, I'm gonna use March dollars to pay April 1st mortgage. Well, then I just simply come down to rent or mortgage in that align to that pay period that I get paid on the 25th and I type in, you know, whatever my monthly mortgage is for the next month. But I know that with March dollars, I got to take care of it. So with March 25th dollar, see, and this is why I love doing all of this by the pay period instead of just the month. So I'm not just genuinely or generally asking, you know, dollars in March. I'm specifically saying when I get paid on March 25th, I need to have enough dollars to pay for April 1st's mortgage. Right. So that's just one example. Now, for anybody who, you know, maybe that pay period isn't large, like maybe there's not enough funds or maybe it just drains all of your funds out of one pay period. You don't have to take you don't have to pay your mortgage in one lump sum. Mm -hmm. You could say maybe my my mortgage is seventeen hundred dollars a month. And so why in the world would I have done such an odd number when I have to like sit here and calculate <laughs> it myself? Um, so maybe I take $850 from my March 11th paycheck and another $850 from my March 25th paycheck. And together, these two then you know, uh, make up the $1,700 that I need for rent or mortgage. Mm -hmm. So it's just, a, it's just that plan, right? It's that plan that allows you to kind of look and see these are the dollars coming in. These are the dollars going out, but today we're also talking about the execution and what I love about this. Outside of those instances like you where there's auto payments, so maybe I'm auto paying my car insurance, right? Because I get an, an additional discount if I let them just automatically automatically withdraw those dollars from my checking account. So, okay, that's on auto pay. I'm still going to be able to figure out which one that lines up to which pay period it lines up to so that I know when those dollars are coming out. But for everything else that's not automatic, the great thing about this is once it's planned out and I've crossed all the T's, I've got all the I's and I'm like, that's my budget for the month. 
then when I get paid on March 25th, you know what execution looks like? Mm -hmm. It looks like about 20 minutes of my day, you know, scheduling what other payments are not automatic, taking out cash from the bank for my cash envelopes. And then I don't look at this thing for another 14 days. Mm -hmm. And I take, you know, so I've taken maybe 30 minutes before the month begins to plan it all out. Mm -hmm. And then I take 20 minutes twice a month to execute on what I said the plan was. Mm -hmm. And if I have to make adjustments along the way, I make adjustments, but we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I see a lot of head nodding, so I want to give you a, a chance to kind of react. And I love it because, you know, I think sometimes we, I hear a lot that, oh, it takes so much time. I don't have the time. I don't have the time. And really, you do have the time if it's important to you, but it doesn't take that much time, right? I mean, I go through my budget weekly, um, and it's literally 10 minutes, right? It's just 10 minutes at the end of the week. I go through, even though I've got things on auto pay for my peace of mind and just knowing, because let's be honest, sometimes technology, it fails. Maybe an automatic payment, maybe a card expired, right? And that payment mm. didn't get taken out and I don't want to incur right. late fees. So I go through my checking account. Um, generally I do it on Saturdays or Sundays, you know, just kind of log in, see, you know, what's been pulled, did all of my automatic payments for that week, did they in fact get taken out? Um, and I just make a check mark, you know, I, I check it off my budget. Yep. It's done, paid. Fabulous. I'm sorry. Did you just say that you reconcile your checking account <laughs> and your credit card statement? You, you, you take the time to like line up and see like if the things that you thought were going to be charged were actually charged. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. It's nuts. People do that. Yeah. And if you, and if you can't hear it in my voice, I'm dripping with sarcasm right now because I absolutely agree in the practice. I too, like so many times I've sat down with clients and you hear it time and time again. It's they start to go through like their credit card statement or even their checking account if they do have things linked to a debit card instead of a credit card. And you start going through things and they're like, I had no idea I was still being charged for this. Mm -hmm. Or I totally forgot about that subscription. Or Oh, that like, I don't know if everybody knows, but you know, here we are early part of 2022 and Amazon prime is increasing their rates. And so, so many times the other thing is I had no idea that that subscription went up, right? Because, because the art of reconciling your account and just kind of double checking and saying, okay, this is what I planned for. Is that what actually happened? That that skill, that art has, it's like a lost art. It, it's gone. And so I encourage all of my clients, not only to put a budget down on paper, but to your point, have a place where you can kind of mark off like that actually happened. And that was actually the amount, um, you know, like you had budgeted $120 for electricity. It only came out to 102, you know, just that, that moment of reconciliation to say, okay, I budgeted enough and that was good. And sometimes you find out you didn't budget enough and you need to adjust next time. So it's such an important part of the actual execution of your money plan. And it's not enough. I don't know that I can stress this enough. It is not enough to simply look at the balance in your checking account and know that you're going to be okay. It's not no. enough. The balance truthfully plays such a minor part in the scheme of things that um, it's really looking at what you budgeted, what you planned for versus what you've actually spent. You're, you're deciding and you're, you're recognizing where your dollars went. And, you know, and I do this at the end of every month too, you know, that, you know, I do a, um, like a budget closeout, you know, I close out my monthly budget and, and why do I want to do that? Well, for several reasons. Right. I want to know that I actually executed my budget the way I wanted to. Right. I want to know that I'm following the plan that I laid out in the beginning. I am going through and I'm double checking. Okay. Where did I have a surplus or did I not budget enough? You know, did I write some goals for myself and did I meet them or did I not meet them? Why or why not? It's an evaluation period, but it also allows me to write the next month's budget 
you know, to look ahead. What's happening next month? What do I need to be prepared for? And where do I need to be making those, you know, adjustments? My electric, okay, my electric went down. So do I anticipate it going, you know, down? Do I anticipate it going up? What's happening? And doing that evaluation time. So closing out my budget and getting the next one ready to go. Um, and none of the, I say my account balance is such a small, small piece of the puzzle, right? It's, yeah. it's looking at the entire, the big picture. Yep. It's super dangerous, in my opinion, to to rely on the checking account balance to any degree uh, for for a number of different reasons. One, one that once that money comes in, you know that there are obligations for those dollars. It That's not a free for all. And so even if on paper in your budget, you kind of said, okay, this is the money coming in. This is the money going out. Well, until it actually leaves your account, mm -hmm. it's, it's as good as gone. So looking at that higher balance means nothing because those dollars are as good as gone. Mm -hmm. And the other, I, I, I've noticed this behavior, you know, I, I'm guilty of this behavior, but I see it in clients all the time too. And that is, when we when we have money coming in, we think about the things that we need to to buy or do or whatever. However, it is that we need to spend money, but we we fail to ever maybe keep a running tally in our head. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you, a, I'm gonna bring to life what I'm actually talking about because this <laughs> happens with tax refunds all the time. Yeah. Okay. So you, you do your taxes. And it says that you're going to get a two thousand dollar refund, a four thousand. I don't care how big or small it is. Let's say it's a two thousand dollar refund. What we do as human beings is, in our mind, we're like, "Oh, I need to get that thing, that whatever that thing is, and it's seven hundred dollars." Okay, I can get that thing. Oh, but I need to get that other thing too, and that thing's like four hundred dollars. Okay, I can get that thing. But what we haven't done is we haven't added the seven hundred and the four hundred dollars yet. We've to completely missed that step. So then we do this like 10 times over again. And if if the average, let's to make the numbers easy, let's say you do that 10 times mm -hmm. and the average is $500. Well, you have just mentally spent $5,000, but you're only getting a $2,000 refund. Yeah. So you, it it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm to do these things as only as simply a mental activity. And it's really, really important to do it as a tangible physical activity, mm -hmm. one that you execute quickly on so that you actually see like what's really going on instead of what you think's going on. And I have another point about that, but I, I'm going to pause, take a breath, and I'm going to let you uh, <laughs> kind of respond to that. No, it's a good point. You know, spending the money before you actually get it, you know, and, um, you know, and one thing that I wanted to say too, that to go along with that tangible, you know, visually looking at it, right. That visual, you know, whether I like my planner, you can print it off. You can do it on the computer, right. And print it off and hang it in your office or hang it on the refrigerator. Having that visual in front of you all the time is very powerful. And when you're physically writing your budget, you're giving those dollars a job and you're saying that this is what's important to me right now. And it helps when some of those unexpected things come up or the, I want, I want, I want, or I need to do this. I need you. You have an opportunity at that point to evaluate, is this really important to me right now? I didn't include it in my budget. So is this really important to me right now? Right. And so it changes your whole mindset on money and, and, by determining what is important to you by writing it down and giving your dollars a job. Mm -hmm. The other point I wanted to make about, um, <clears throat> Ooh, am I going to lose it? I lost my thought for, mm. for a second there. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to have to come back to it. I'm going to have to come back to it. Well, interrupt me if it comes back. <laughs> All right. Fair yeah. enough. 
But um, I just, I think it's important that, you know, it, it again, it's the execution, right? If you're going to write a budget, then write it and follow through with it. So write it, you're given those dollars a job, you're determining what's important to you, what your goals are, and then go through and whether you do it weekly or you do it, you know, by pay period, it, it doesn't matter as long as you're doing it and you're kind of, you're reconciling, right? You're, you're making sure that what you've spent is what you plan for. Um, and to me, boy, that eases stress in my life. It eases the stress. It just 100%. Goes, I'm, I'm good. You know, like things can happen unexpected. I know I've got my, and you know, here's another thing that I want when we're budgeting in our plan, in deciding what's important to you, you know, I always put down how I'm, and this might be a little bit off topic, but it's not just the bills and not just my cash envelopes, right? Like I'm, because I am debt free, so I don't have any debt payments, but I'm also including and making sure that I'm putting down what money am I sending to savings? You know, what money am I investing? Mm -hmm. What, you know, because those are important things for me and we've reevaluated and actually because, um, because of some of our podcasts, the things that we filmed, I've done things and made some adjustments to my own budget, going more digital on some things. For example, my mm -hmm. my Christmas budget, you know. And so now, instead of pulling that cash out for my cash envelope for Christmas, it's now in a digital savings account, you know, online. And so I've made those adjustments, and that's something new for me in my budget. And so um, that's why I reconcile, and that's why I make this plan, right? That just yeah. to know I, the peace of mind and the less stress that life is stressful. And if this is an area we can reduce that, why the heck not? <laughs> yeah, I, I completely agree that um, by putting it down on paper and then executing, the, the part of that plan should include all the other things that you talked about, right? It's not just the income and your, your monthly bills. Mm -hmm. It's everything. It's, you know, what are you contributing to saving? What are you contributing to investing? It's a plan for all of your money. And and some of that money is going to just sit in the checking account as kind of a buffer against life. Mm -hmm. In in addition to your peace of mind fund, which is your bigger buffer against life. But I, I cannot agree with you more that like the stress starts to melt away. Mm -hmm. Think about what I said earlier. I execute for about 20 minutes twice a month. Mm -hmm. And after that 20 minutes, I don't think about it for another 14 days. I don't think about my money for the next 14 days because I know everything has been planned out. The mo Any money I want to spend, it's already in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Any money I need to put food on the table has already been played uh, planned for. All of that stress goes away. Mm -hmm. And it brings me back to the point that I was going to make earlier and that is well two points really one i think a lot of people hesitate to put their plan down on paper because they're worried about what it's going to look like mm. and we usually make it a lot worse in our heads <laughs> yeah. than it actually is yes that's number one mm -hmm. and, and and sorry to kind of that circles back to the stress piece of it too, right? Like, cause right now you're stressing out about it and you're worried about it and you don't want to put it down on paper because you think it's going to be a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Almost to a client. I can't think of maybe more than one client where the situation was actually worse on paper than it was in their head for the absolute, almost every single client of mine, it was worse in their head than it was when we got it down on paper. When we got it down on paper, they're like, that's not as bad as I thought it was. <laughs> and the, the stress, even that, just saying those words, yeah, the stress started to reduce. Well, imagine if you weren't thinking about your money for 14 days, how mm -hmm. stress-free, how stressless your finances might be if you could just put them aside for 14 days, do what you know that you plan to do, and then revisit them in two weeks. Right. And, you know, and, to that point exactly, that you're, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes a month, right? Looking at your finances, evaluating. <clears throat> I don't know about you, Nino, but I can tell you I spent way more time before I started budgeting and getting my money, you know, in control. Way more 
<clears throat> than 20, 30, 40 minutes a month stressing and looking over what's my account balance, looking at checking it, you know, 42 times a day, right? Because where's the money? Oh, something extra. Shoot, did that come out? I don't have enough money. Do I need, you know, way more time was associated. I spent way more time stressing out and moving stuff around and putting payments off and, you know, trying to decide then now when you just spend, and, and, you know, let's be honest here, we've been doing this for a little bit longer. And so somebody that's, I was going to say the same, right. So anybody that's brand new and just starting out your budget, yes, it's going to take longer. And when I'm working with clients, yes, I have you looking at things daily, you know, so you're, because this is a whole new thought process and we're developing different mindsets and different habits. So, you know, it, it does take some more time. But I guarantee it's time that still reduces stress and it makes you more aware of where you're at. And so, yes, to start off with, it's going to be a little bit more than, you know, 40 minutes, even an hour a month. But I think well worth the time investment um, because it pays you back in the end. Yeah. And you you captured my thought right from my head. And that is, yes, we're talking about established like once you are established you're you're looking at the you know you're planning once for about 30 minutes you're executing for about 10 to 20 minutes twice a month and that's when you're you're fully established you're absolutely right in the beginning it does take a little extra time but to your other point the moment it gets down on paper there's a little bit of relief there Maybe still a little bit of stress and whatnot because you're like, you don't see it. But I'm telling you right now, if you sat down with Sarah or I, you know, shameless plug, (laughs) we could help you Mm -hmm. see exactly the timeline and the trajectory and and what it's going to take and how long it's going to take. And, you know, clients are blown away sometimes with, wait a minute, I can be out of debt in – I sat down with a couple – not too long ago, who, again, just like most people thought their situation was really, really bad. And when we took a look at like their income, their, uh, what I would call their necessities when it comes to their, their, um, expenses and then like their debt, we kind of crunched some numbers and we found out that they could be out of debt in eight months. And they're like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, look here, well, We'll tr- we'll project everything out, and obviously this is like as long as nothing crazy happens. But like here's the path, and here's how we can do it. And they they were just completely floored at the idea that they would have zero debt, and it's not that they had tons and tons of debt. So that's why it was also kind of easy. But like they were like, wait a minute, we can get out from underneath these credit cards, and we can have the car paid in eight months. Yeah, sometimes. I'm not guaranteeing to every single one of our listeners you're going to be out of debt in eight months. But I, what I can guarantee you is with with somebody who's a little bit farther along in all of this than yourself, they can help you to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, I think that's one of the best moments I have while coaching, you know, is just to see that moment on clients' faces when when we're able to go through things and to say, you know what, you can be, it's going to be 14 months, right? When they're thinking they, Mm -hmm. they have no idea it's going to be, I'm going to be in the situation forever. Right. And when you're able, when we sit down and Mm -hmm. go through things, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, if you don't mind, I, I just had a follow-up call with somebody, some clients that I worked with for, we worked together for 13 months. And when I met them, I think I've mentioned them before, but I'm going to just bring the situation up because I think it's important um, that when I met them, they had four kids under the age of six. Um, they were overdrafting in their account twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month. Right, really could not see anything positive in their situation. And I'll tell you now, it's been um, about a year and a half. So we worked together for thirteen months, and it, you know, about another eight months or so. They've been they got rid of in 13 months, $132,000 worth of debt to become debt free. And, you know, I just talked to her the other night and they were able to save up enough money. They bought a brand new pickup and paid cash for it. This is somebody, you know, and I say that because 
people think I don't, I don't have enough money to budget. I don't have enough <laughs> money to get out of debt. I don't make enough. And the truth is, is none of that's true. They didn't have a plan. And when, and they will tell you, you know, you could talk to them now. They did not believe me when I told them that they could get out of debt way quicker and turn their situation around. When I showed them, they were like, no, we don't believe you. <laughs> like, really? I we don't believe you. And they've done it. And I think that's powerful when you put the plan down on paper and you mm -hmm. can see that they had no idea where their money was going. They just know that it was leaving. It was leaving right. their account faster than it was coming in. And that's the power of a budget and putting a plan down. It's, it's one of the best things. One of the, I love it. I love, and you know, I'm a little bit of a nerd maybe when it comes to writing budgets, you know, cause I, I do enjoy doing it, but just showing people that it doesn't matter your income or, or um, where you're at having that plan and seeing it and then executing that plan because it's not enough just to write it. You have to execute it. Right. Your life changes. Your life changes. It really does. Yeah. yeah. It reminds me that like in, you know, our listeners may have heard me say this in the past and I'll continue to preach it because I, I firmly believe in it. It does not matter if you make $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. What matters is how you manage the money you have. Absolutely. And when you manage it well, you can accomplish some really big feats. Now, sometimes we got to talk about the income side of things. And we got to talk about, you know, you, is there a side hustle that you can be doing and something to get the income up? And sometimes it's, it's cutting some of those things that you really enjoy. But anything that you decide to do, I also like to remind people it's for a season. Yeah. Right. You might only have to work a side hustle for a couple of, you know, when I say a couple of months, I probably mean more like six to eight months, but it's not like you're going to be working two jobs for the rest of your life. It's not that you can never have another Starbucks coffee ever. Mm -hmm. It's, can you take some time during the season to do something different, to get different results? And, and if you do, you can accomplish things way beyond what you might otherwise think you can. Right. Right. And you know, when I say, you know, I say a couple of things, but short-term sacrifices for long-term goals is something, you know, and if nothing changes, if you, if you're not willing to change anything, then nothing's going to change. Right. I mean, it's, it's very cliche, but, mm -hmm. and another thing I just want to put out there that, you know, you have an opportunity. Every single one of us has an opportunity to make a decision today that our future self is going to thank us for. And in my opinion, <clears throat> getting that budget and executing your plan, your future self is going to thank you for doing that. Um, because while it might be tough right mm. now, things only get more difficult. They just get more difficult unless you're willing to mm. make a change today and that commitment today. So. And on the other side of that same coin, because I love that. On the other side of that coin, your future self is going to kick your, yourself in the <laughs> pants right. for certain things and wish you had, mm -hmm. right? So as much as your future self will thank you for some decisions that you do make, yes. your future self can also want to kick yourself in the pants for decisions you didn't make, yes. right? Yes. So I, I would love that. Um, <laughs> wow. Well, um, an, just another great... Another great episode of Tackling the Taboo, talking about this thing called personal finances that's wildly personal. And, um, you know, it, it's it's never – it's I, I never want to sit here and make it seem like it's easy. But it gets easy. Like once you make the decision to do something different and uh, enact some of these uh, new money habits, uh, it, it, it can take you far. That does remind me of one other thing that I wanted to kind of uh, let our listeners kind of marinate on because we don't have time to jump into it today. But sometimes to pay off all the debt might take some time, right? Maybe it does take longer than 18 months. Maybe it takes three or four years. But 
one of the principles that we live by is paying debt off in phases. And so there are different types of debts to be paid off earlier than other debts. So um, I, I won't get into all of the phases right now, but just understand that the other great feeling of accomplishment can come when you have your debt outlined in different phases and you've tackled phase one and you're out of debt. You know, So maybe getting out of phase one of debt only takes 12 months. Maybe you still have to, some others to do, but personal from like a, a personal note real quick, uh, we, we decided our phase one, my wife and I was all of the consumer debt, car loans, credit cards, store, you know, charge cards, all that stuff. And phase two was going to be the student loans. Because if I looked at both of those things together, it was too much and it was overwhelming. Sure. So phase one became the consumer debt. And we were able to knock that out in under two years. I think it took us 19, 19, 19 or 20 months uh, to pay off $36,000 of consumer debt. Wow. So wow. got that out of the way. And then was able to focus on the student loan debt. So sometimes doing it in phases also just helps to continue to motivate you to hit those milestones. Right. And, you know, I'll just put in as a side note, you know, talking about that, that it might have to take longer. You know, for my husband and I, it was 12 years. It took us 12 years okay. to get all of our debt paid off. And, you know, I say that very freely and very openly to say that we were not this, hey, six months and it's done or eight months, right? I mean, it was... It was 12 years it took us to get our debt paid off. So when I say that I know that, you know, there's some struggles and it's hard, boy, you are looking at the girl that, you know, 12 years it took us. Now there's a lot and, you know, well, I'm sure a lot will come up in, you know, future episodes on why it took us that long and, you know, some definite mistakes that we made and, you know, some learning. But, you know, it's, I just want people to know that it's okay if it takes you a little bit longer as long as you yeah. stay the course, right? This isn't, um, you know, the fastest one to the finish line wins, right? Everybody can yeah. reach the finish line as long as you keep going and you keep going and you keep moving forward. And so. It's a really good reminder because, you know, uh, I think if, if you're listening to this podcast, you may have come across others who are kind of sharing in this desire to, you know, re regain control of their finances and get out of debt. And so you, maybe you've heard stories about people paying off $120,000 of debt in, in 18 months. And, and you're like, there's no way I can do that. And, and so sometimes that can leave us to believe, why should I even bother? And I'm saying bother because, and, and so thank you for being so transparent with how long it did take you because I think we always hear of these like great success stories and we feel like if we can't live up to that then why should we bother and you're a good um, case study for why it, it you should still do it because you can still attain that thing that you want mm -hmm. that seems elusive and maybe it just took you a little longer right right and that's why I share the stories Right. That I'm just a real person, you know, a real human that's had a lot of crazy life happen. And but you just keep moving forward because there were dreams to be lived. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I love, you know, thank you for another great conversation. You know, I really I love this so much. And, um, you know, just again, normalizing the conversation, just opening up and, and talking about things that a lot of times people don't want to talk about. So thank you for having these conversations with me. Of course. I want to remind all of our listeners and our viewers on uh, YouTube and Rumble that you can find um, downloads to helpful tools in our descriptions. You can go to newmoneyhabits.com and download uh, free tools there as well. If you're looking to schedule time with either Sarah or myself, there are links available for that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, another great attack on the taboo. And uh, we thank every one of our listeners for tuning in. We look forward to continuing the conversation next time. Thank you for listening to the New Money Habits podcast brought to you by New Money Habits and Keeping Up with the Joneses Financial Coaching. Submit your questions to our host by emailing podcast at newmoneyhabits.com. Be sure to subscribe to be notified of future episodes. 
Join our growing group of like-minded people on Facebook and follow us on your favorite platform. Music provided by Summer School.